glorious God, we remember how your disciples were huddled in their rooms that Sabbath day waiting for the sun to rise on the first day of the week. And God, if we're honest, we sometimes are, ourselves are huddled away from all the sadness, from the challenges, from our disappointments, and all the rest of this life. But today, as we come to worship, we rejoice because, Lord Jesus, you did rise. You were resurrected from the dead, and the tomb was empty, just as you said. Praises to you, Father God, for our Lord Jesus and the empty tomb. We rejoice, and we welcome you, Holy Spirit, to be present among us. Breathe on us again, Lord Jesus, so we might glorify you and come out of our hiddenness and tell the good news about the resurrection. Amen. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes and not another. How my heart yearns within me. Early on the first day of the week, while I was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that a stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings laying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings laying there in the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in the place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believes. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead, and the other disciples returned to the home. home. This is the word of the Lord. Our third scripture this morning is from John, as we continue on in that story that Samuel started for us. Thank you, Sam. Starting at verse 11. <clears throat> well, it helps if you're in John and not Acts. Whoops. There we go. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. When it was evening on that first day of the week and the doors of the house where the disciples were, had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed him his hands and his side. And then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. May God add his blessing to the reading, the hearing, the preaching, and the living of God's holy word. How do we understand what someone is telling us if we can't even imagine that that could happen? 
Jesus told his disciples that he would lay down his life and pick it up again. He also said, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. And as I thought about this, I realized his disciples could not imagine what he was really saying. They weren't ready to hear about his death and resurrection. So that early morning, on that first day of the week, when Mary Magdalene arrived at the tomb, she saw the stone was moved, and the tomb was open. And so she runs. She runs to call Peter and John, because it's not as she thought it would be. And then they all went, well, they don't they all ran back. It doesn't say that Mary ran, but the guys ran back. And they look in the tomb. They go in the tomb, and it's empty, except there's other empty things in there, empty grave cloths, folded up. It's just there on the stone. Right in front of them was the evidence, the evidence of Jesus' resurrection. And yet they didn't see that. They couldn't believe that. They, it says that John believed, but he didn't believe he was risen. It doesn't say what he actually believed. They were bewildered. No one seemed to remember, I lay it down, and I'll take it back up three days. Isn't it interesting the questions that angels asked Mary? Why are you weeping? The unspoken question being, don't you realize Jesus is alive? And then she doesn't have that question asked to her, so she's still weeping, and then she turns, and who's there? Well, the gardener. <laughs> Wasn't the gardener, and Jesus asked her, why are you weeping, and whom are you looking for? What he didn't ask was, don't you see? It's me. We approach Easter morning with excitement, especially when we're kids. You know, there's the Easter bunny and the baskets and all the goodies. But I wonder how much we realize the resurrection is real and is important to our everyday lives, not just one Sunday a year. It is a great story that we hear, like some confetti from the eggs. We enjoy it for a moment, and then we're on to the rest of our lives, right? For our Bible study group, we commented as we were talking about this chapter that we realized we'd missed so many details because we hadn't read them carefully. We were just used to hearing the story, and we weren't really paying attention to what the story was really telling us. Maybe we think of resurrection as what happens one day when Jesus finally comes back. But what if resurrection could be part of every day? So I want to take a little tri side trip today over to Matthew's Gospel. The Sadducees came to see and test Jesus. You know, the Pharisees had been trying. This is chapter 22. They'd been trying to test Jesus, and they kept the testing wasn't working. They were trying to trap him. They couldn't trap Jesus. So here come the Sadducees. And they are the wealthy, aristocratic governing class. The chief, the high priests were, were often part of the Sadducees. So they, re, they refused to accept the prophets or the prophetic books. The only part of scripture they accept are the first five books of the Old Testament. And they don't believe in the resurrection. The con by contrast, the Pharisees proclaimed and believed that any man who denied the resurrection of the dead, were shut out from God. I learned a little bit about these two groups. Very interesting. So the Sadducees, not, not believing anything about resurrection, they cook up this uh, story that they're going to, to bring to Jesus about leveret marriage, about a widow who marries the one man he dies, and all of his brothers, seven brothers or something ridiculous like that. And they bring this story, and they want to know whose wife is she going to be Whose husband is going to be her, you know, whose wife is she going to be in the resurrection? That's how it goes. To which Jesus replied, you are wrong, because you know not, neither the scriptures nor the power of God. As for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is God not of the dead, but of the living. Add to this Job's statement of belief that Sam read this morning and his belief in the resurrection, and we find that the resurrection was not a new idea. Job proclaimed, I know my Redeemer lives, and after my skin is destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. How my heart yearns within me for that time. 
God is God of the living, not the dead. But here's the interesting thing. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, although they were in relationship with God all their lives, they died. But Jesus said they're still alive to God. And Jesus hadn't died, and he hadn't risen from the dead yet. So then we might wonder, well, then why do we need Jesus' resurrection? I mean, well, when we come to the table, which we will do in a few moments, we hear Jesus say that his blood is a new covenant for the forgiveness of our sins. Jesus came to restore a right relationship between creation, and that means all of us too, and God. Through him, the whole system of the sacrificial system of sin, you know, that the whole sacrificial thing they did to cover up their sin was demolished, done away with. He became the ultimate sacrifice for sin, and he took on the curse of sin. Through Jesus, we receive resurrection life. The moment we trust and believe in him, for it is through him that we have life with God today and for eternity. Well, after Jesus called Mary's name and she realized who he was, he sent her as the very first evangelist to tell the good news of this resurrection excitement to the disciples. But even though they heard the news, did you hear that next part of scripture? Later that day, they were hidden behind locked doors. But that didn't stop Jesus. Ever the good shepherd, he came and stood there, right there among them, through the locked doors. And some believe this group also included Mary Magdalene and the others as well. And he said to them, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, now I sent, have sending you. And then what did he do? He breathed the Holy Spirit on them. The transition from Jesus walking with them to them walking in the power of the Spirit was beginning. And from this gift of the Spirit, Jesus helps them understand their new role as apostles. Did you hear his instruction? If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. I don't know what Jesus meant by that, do you? At first glance, this may seem like they get to decide who is forgiven and who isn't. That's how it seems to read. What are these sins Jesus is talking about, though? Well, we have to look and see how sin is defined in the Gospel of John. Earlier in chapter 16, Jesus talks to the disciples about the Holy Spirit. And he says, when he, the advocate, comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment, about sin because they do not believe in me, about righteousness because I'm going to the Father and you will no longer see me, and about judgment because the ruler of this world has been condemned. Hmm. Each of those statements is kind of surprising, and maybe not the way we think the Holy Spirit will prove the world wrong. But we do come to understand in them that sin is not believing in Jesus. Commentary writer Herman Ruderbos explains, therefore, the authority to forgive and to retain the sins of others that Jesus gives his disciples does not consist in the application of moral standards, but in placing people before the decisive choice to accept in faith the grace of God manifest in the sending of his Son, or they can remain in sin. Or as another commentary writer describes, as people come to know and abide in Jesus, they will be released from their sins. If, however, those sent by Jesus fail to bear witness, people will remain stuck in their unbelief. Their sins will be retained. The stakes of this mission are very high indeed. Jesus came to take away the sins of the world. Remember, he was the Lamb of God. He came to bring redemption, inviting people to move from darkness into light, from perishing to eternal life or resurrection life. The commission of the disciples is ours, if we're willing, as we receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will help us to share the good news that Jesus offers us, resurrection life. But what does that really mean? It means as we know him and trust him more and more, more and more of our sin will be forgiven because we'll 
Surrender it to him. As we move from death to in sin, we move out of that, we move into life, resurrection life that we can have with God. Not only today, but forever. And as I tell the children, we need to pray about that. So let's go to God in prayer. Well, Lord Jesus, it's a relief to know that we don't have to go around telling people their sins and deciding whether we have to forgive them or not. It's, it's a relief to know that when the Holy Spirit gives us new breath and new life in you, that, that we can simply explain who you are. Invite people to know the Jesus we know, the one who rose out of a dark and gloomy tomb to bring light and life forever to all those who believe in him to invite us out of the hurts that we carry and give those over to him. Even if those hurts were done to us by other people, we can still give them to you, Jesus. You take them all. You take all our worries. You take all of our fretting. You take all of our fear. You take all the stuff that gets us all bound up like those grave wrappings that had you. Sometimes they make us just so we can hardly move. The anxiety. We just give them to you, Jesus, today. That's, that's the beginning of resurrection. We hand over all the things that are the darkness in our soul. We called it the rocks, our hard, our hard hearts on Thursday night. Well, it's the same thing in a different form. We give them to you, Jesus. Because if we keep them, it's just going to make us unable to move, unable to have joy, and really unable to have your peace. We thank you. We thank you that that's what you came to do. And that's why you stepped out of the tomb after you endured the cross. It was to free us. So we bless you this morning, Jesus. We thank you for that Easter reminder and that Easter gift. And you the reminder that we can have it every day of the week, 365 days of the year. We just have to come to you. So this morning, Lord, we are grateful and we, we think about the mess in our world. It's not quite like the confetti on the floor, but maybe a little bit. It's, it's, there's just lots of places where it's a mess, where people are, are overwhelmed and in all kinds of ways. Would you help us to just, wherever the corner of the world we are, to shine your light? Would you show us how to be that light? We don't have to be a searchlight. We could be a flashlight. We could be a pen light. We can be the light you call us to be, whatever that is. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you, you are sometimes just that small, still voice. Everything wants to crowd you out, but you come with the peace of Christ. Thank you for coming this morning on this glorious Easter Sunday morning and resting in us and on us with a new understanding of love that we might share that love with a very hurting group of people who doesn't know. Lord, this morning we think of those that are Uh, maybe having physical hurts. We think of, um, there are many women on our prayer list who are struggling with breast cancer. Um, God, and we 
we lift them to you today. Um, thank you that you know each one by name. And you are in the midst of all of that peace and goodness in all the stages of which they are in treatment and care. Thank you, Lord. We thank you for being with Dorothy and Kenny this morning as Dorothy is doubly under the weather with flu and strep. So we bless you, Lord, for your special presence with them. Lord, we think of the families up in Baltimore whose family members died in that bridge collapse. And some, they haven't been recovered, Lord. So we lift up those families this morning for a sure and certain knowledge of the resurrection today, Lord, that they would just know, they would know that's who you are. For the comfort they need that only you can give and, Lord, the rest of the community that's hurting because, because lots of jobs are being put on standstill while that, the crane and the ship are moved out of the way of that port. So, Lord, we, we lift up those families that are struggling. And we thank you that you are very aware and that others, I'm sure, and, Lord, I believe that you are calling to help, to help with those but this week has been a hard week. And Lord, we prayed last night, and we'll pray again for Clorox Company that's having some troubles in their plant. And so we lift up all the workers there. This has been a hard time when things get shut down because of a problem. We thank you, Lord, for grace. You care about even our work lives. And Lord, that there would be Easter, and there would be comfort and help for those workers, too. Lord, we bless you this day that you are the God who they said the Holy Spirit came to convict the world. And so the world needs to know about, about you. The places where there's a lot of hurting going on in our world. So many varieties. But it doesn't overwhelm you, oh God. You sent Jesus to reconcile the world with you. So we are believing today for that reconciliation all over our world and in creation as we pray these prayers in and through you, Jesus. Amen. It is now time when we give back out of the goodness and the grace of God. Let's do that now.
God, we praise you and thank you for the gifts that you have are not just ones we can see and touch. They are gifts that are, are like an empty tomb that no one knew you were going to empty, that Jesus is going to rise ever so quietly, oh God. You are at work, and you are the greatest giver ever. We bless you and thank you. Take these gifts we have bring back to you and use them for your glory that all the world should know Jesus. Amen. This morning, let us say what we believe by using the Nicene Creed, which should be on the screen, but also in your hymnal on page 34. Let us confess the faith of the universal church. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. Let us stay standing if you're able and sing our communion hymn. Let us, at talents and tongues, employ. Each time we sing the refrain, we're only going to sing it once. us bread to tell, bread to share. God, Emmanuel, everywhere. Jesus lives again. Earth can breathe again. Pass the word around. Loops of love. You may be seated. There's a wasp in the cup. Well, that's lovely, isn't it? Um, Anybody feel like fishing a wasp out? Did you come for communion today, all of God's creation? Let me see. I have Kleenex. (laughs) No, I'm not allergic. I just don't like them. You want to come be with the flowers? There you go. All right. You never know. He just flew? 
Well, he may be back. I just didn't have the heart to squish him. Oh, well, this is the feast, the glorious feast of the people of God and wasps too, evidently. Let us go to God in prayer. We rejoice this day, Lord God. We bless you for your glorious plan of sending Jesus after us. We rejoice as we celebrate new life, even as we come to this table, which tells us the story of your son Jesus, sacrificing his life for us so that we could be made whole. And Lord, receiving the resurrection in him so we might always be one with you. Hallelujah. We bless you for bread and cup and all of your creation. <laughs> You've made it all, even the beautiful little wasps that were sitting right here on the cup. We thank you for the goodness and the glory we see there. We thank you that you give us everything we need as we trust in you for each day, especially for the new life you have for us. We pray and believe that you will open our eyes as we receive this meal, that we might receive your breath, that you are already breathing on us, your Holy Spirit, who inspires us to live as people forgiven and able to share Jesus so others may receive the same. In you, Christ Jesus, we pray as we pray together the prayer you taught us, praying with you, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On that night when Jesus was gathered with his disciples, and we don't know what other critters might have been there, he was sitting at table with them, just as we are sitting today. And he took the bread that was on the table, said, this is my body given to you. Do this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup from the table and said, this is a cup of a new covenant in my blood for the remission, for the paying the debt, for the forgiveness of the washing away of all your sin, past, present, and future. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, we remember Christ's death until he comes again. Let us share in the feast of the people of God.
Body of Christ. You like it up here, don't you? blood of Christ. Let us pray. Oh God, you let us taste and see that you are good. In your son Jesus, you give us gifts from heaven so that we can live on earth in peace. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 238, Thine is the Glory. Let us stand and sing as we're able. Jesus. 
Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Go in peace and share the peace of Christ, knowing that he goes with you wherever you go. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.